Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike and your host, and this is part one of our interview with Paco Chirichi. In this episode, Paco chats about flying the A6 Intruder, that talks about his handling, its intended role, and also some great stories that include a Tornado F3 and also an angry marine. I also want to thank our sponsor, Laco Watches, who were one of the original companies to produce pilot watches for the Luftwaffe during World War II. They produce both A and B dial watches in different sizes to suit all tastes, which adopt the look of times gone by but still satisfied modern demands. You can check out all their models and products via www.laco.d. Thank you. So Paco, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, as a young child, um, I was drawn into aviation uh, like a lot of young kids are, mm -hmm. um, you know, built the models, did all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then it kind of waned for a little bit. I didn't have a, an aviation background in my family, so um, there was nothing to sustain that interest uh, until I needed money to go to school, to get mm -hmm. to university. And uh, the uh, Navy ROTC was a, a great avenue for me. You know, I don't, I don't know if you or your listeners are familiar with it, but it's, it's, um, it's a scholarship uh, that the Navy uh, gives you to, you know, go to college and then, of course, it has uh, four to ten years of service, depending on which track you take. Uh, it was great for me. I jumped in and, um, you know, really enjoyed the community, but I was still wasn't necessarily uh, super focused on aviation until uh, the summer of my sophomore year. I got a ride, uh, a backseat ride in F-14 oh, wow. uh, at Miramar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this is this is unfortunately in terms of my age. This is before the movie Top Gun came out. The summer before Top Gun came out, um, and I got a backseat ride in F-14, and uh, it changed my life. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, being afflicted with an incurable virus. I was uh, completely smitten. Um, it happened to be on a Wednesday night, which at the time was the big rockin' night at the Miramar O Club. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I got to fly in the backseat of an F-14 during the day. And then uh, the whole squadron, uh, you know, my, my flight took me out that night to the club and, and I had a great time that night. And I was just uh, in absolute heaven. So from from basically that moment on, uh, I, I dedicated my life to to flying uh, fighters in the Navy. I'd say a funny side story or a side note from that day and that flight is, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about the movie Top Gun. It wasn't there wasn't um, any buzz about it at the base. Uh, the guy who I flew with didn't say anything about it. Um, but, you know, nine months later, when I was sitting in the movie theater watching the credits, his name popped up. The dude that flew me around, uh, his name popped up. He was the aerial coordinator for the movie Top Gun. And I was his first flight back in the squadron after a month off. Wow. Uh, you know, after filming, he was just exhausted, took a month of vacation, came back, and I was his warm-up flight. So it was kind of a neat, uh, you know, tie-in to that film. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about the, some of the basic aircraft you uh, started training on when you actually started your flying training. What were they and what would they like to fly? Um, they were, in order, uh, the T-34 uh, Mentor. Uh, it's a turboprop, uh, which means it's got a, a small jet engine that turns the propeller. Uh, and then uh, we would go to the if – you, if you – did well in the T-34 at the, at the end of that six-month training window. There was a, tis, a decision point where uh, you could either go uh, jets, um, propellers, like go fly the C-130 or the P-3s, or helicopters. Uh, and again, it was it, as most things in the Navy and in naval aviation, you, you, you put down what you call your dream list, your dream sheet, like I want to fly this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the needs of the Navy always dictate. Um, so there's a, a fluctuating line as to what people uh, actually get. Um, relative to their their selection, their dreams. Um, so I did well enough that I, w I got jet grades, and uh, obviously the needs of the Navy at that time were uh, that they needed people to go fly jets. Uh, and so from the T-34, I went off to fly the T-2. That's a, a twin-engine, two-person uh, trainer plane that doesn't even fly anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got there in uh, 88, 1988, uh, and it was a fantastic uh, jet airplane to learn how to fly in. And then at the end of the T2 uh, training, which again was about six months, uh, we would go take our final exam, which was landing on the aircraft carrier. Um, assuming you did well on that, uh, well enough, uh, you progressed to advanced jets, which was in the TA4 at the time. Um, 
And the TA4 was a huge leap upwards uh, in terms of uh, capability, uh, speed even, uh, and um, sort of the penalty for, for error. Um, you know, the T2 had uh, long straight wings. It was it was the type of plane that if you completely screwed up some kind of an aerobatic maneuver and you were headed straight up and, and got lost, you could just take your hands off the controls and it would eventually fix, you know, it would correct itself and you'd be heading straight down at appropriate airspeed. In the A4, um, if you didn't fly it properly, you could, you know, depart, you could go into a inverted spin, which was almost unrecoverable. You could, you know, there was all kinds of, uh, uh, parameters that you as a young pilot or even as a seasoned pilot could put yourself into that were unrecoverable. So it was, it was a much more serious airplane. I, it felt, um, it felt very real to us, you know, moving from uh, the trainer up to the A4, which, uh, you know, it's a plane that had been used for decades in combat. So, and it, it had guns on it, you know, it's, it's, it was a real airplane. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so we did. We basically did the same things that we had done in the in the T2 in the A4, but much faster and much more precise. And then there was a few extra maneuvers that we learned. Like we learned how to bomb, you know, dive bomb and stuff like that. Fly low levels. It was an, a, a great sense of um, of seriousness flying that A4 round. You really felt like, wow, I'm this is this is real. This is not a trainer anymore. This is a real mm-hmm. uh, warbird, and I'm I'm. Very close to completion, and uh, you know, once I'm done with this, I'm going to be in the in the real world, in the fleet. We call it. So let's talk about your first frontline aircraft, and what were your first thoughts of the A6? Obviously, when I got that backseat ride in the F14, I, it stuck with me, like I said, pretty much forever. Um, and then between. When I got winged, I got winged December 1st of 89, and I wasn't supposed to start flying the A6 until September of 90, so a good, you know, eight, nine months later. Uh, And I um, managed to get myself uh, temporarily assigned to an aggressor squadron down in Miramar, um, which was a fantastic deal. Um, Unfortunately, it completely ruined my active duty life (laughs) because... (laughs) Flying adversary airplanes is pretty much, uh, you know, it's it's an it's super fun thing you can do in the military yeah. and in the navy specifically. So I, I was flying with these guys uh, in the backseat of uh, A fours and and uh, sometimes in T twos, but mostly A fours, and um, they were all F fourteen pilots. Uh, and I had really wanted to fly the F fourteen. That was my number one choice mm-hmm. coming out of training. Um, I think. You know, at the time we had Kingsville, Beeville, and Meridian. There were the three uh, jet training bases in the in the U.S. Navy, and um, you know everybody that graduated in a certain week was lumped into one big pile, and then you know they would line them up with whatever was available. And in the week I graduated, there was only two F-14s, and I was not in the top two, uh, so I didn't get uh, my first choice. Uh, I was assigned the A-6, and you know I was a little I was a little bummed, but you know like I said, you you get um, you get used to the idea that the needs of the Navy dictate and, you know, it's still a great community. But anyway, I went and I started flying, uh, you know, air combat missions with these uh, adversary guys and they're all F-14 pilots. And (laughs) I spent six months with them living in San Diego and flying in these incredible flights and, you know, going to the club with them and listening to them talk. And God, it just ate away at me. I didn't say anything. And one of them finally said, you know, you might want to try to like – See if you can change, get your orders changed. And um, it was it, it was practically heresy to to even conceive of something like that, especially for a new guy. But they 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 got in my ear enough that I submitted a, a package, and I tried to do it really subtly, you know, really quietly, so that I didn't irritate anybody. But <laughs> um, they put me in an F-18 and took all these measurements and put me in an A-6 and they're like, oh, maybe you may may or may not be tall, too tall to go fly the A-6. I'm six foot three, mm-hmm. um, so whatever that is in in terms of meter. But I'm six foot three and um, there was some leeway, some wiggle room that I might have been able to uh, not go fly the A-6 and go fly the Hornet instead, mm-hmm. uh, which wasn't my dream, but at least it was a fighter. Um, and... It didn't work. It got turned down by some higher authority. 
And to me, that was no big deal. Like I didn't tell anybody. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to the ASICs community. I didn't complain or anything. But boy, I'll tell you what, when I showed up at that squadron, every single instructor <laughs> knew that I had tried to, to leave their community. And, um, as I soon found out, the intruder community is incredibly tight and incredibly proud of, uh, you know, their plane and their mission. <laughs> so I was definitely on everybody's shit list from uh, from the word go. Head um, down. <laughs> head down. And it was such a shock to me. I just remember showing up thinking, you know, it's not like I don't like you guys. I just wanted to go fly something else. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, as you learn when you grow up, uh, these, you know, people, people don't think that way. They, they take a they take that as very much of an insult. Mm -hmm. So uh, my first few months in, in the intruder squadron were a little rough, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I love to fly, which is mm -hmm. good. Uh, and uh, I soon learned to love to fly the intruder uh, and kind of everything about it. Um, you asked about my first impressions about the airplane uh, and you know, compared to my dream planes, which are pointy nosed, fast, you know, <laughs> high altitude air combat, uh, the A6 intruder is, uh, was just this hideously ugly beast. <laughs> it's just <laughs> a big blunt nosed side by side. It had the, uh, the aerial refueling probe, um, didn't retract, you know, which was mind boggling to me at the time. It's mm -hmm. just this thing that stuck out from, you know, the, uh, the joint of the radar dome and the, and the, uh, windscreen. And, uh, it just was right there prominently <laughs> displayed in front of the windscreen getting in the way. Um, there was the added indignity of sitting side by side with somebody, you know, as a pilot, you, uh, you, uh, get used to, especially my last plane was the A4, you know, in the A4, you, you feel like you're sitting on the tip of a needle. There's nothing around you. And, you know, I climbed into the A6 and there's a seat right next to me. And it's, you know, when I'm, if I'm making a left hand turn and I'm trying to look out the right side of my cockpit, say on a rendezvous or, you know, flying formation, there's this guy that's in the way and all his gear that he throws up on the <laughs> windscreen. And, you know, it's just, uh, it was a huge adjustment. Yeah, so let's talk about what the intended role of the A6 was, and can you talk us through your ground training as well? Sure. Um, well, the intended role, uh, you know, the A6 had a long and distinguished career. The intended role of it was really to uh, be effective in Vietnam, right? So uh, to be able to come in at low altitude at night um, in the weather and be able to deliver a massive amount of ordnance. So it could carry 28... 500 pound bombs without any modifications and if you took off the uh the one of the gear door panels you could actually put two more bombs so it's 30 wow. 500 pound bombs right so that's you know if you think back to sort of world war ii and uh the ability to deliver a lot of ordnance on target um was a great thing and then you added that radar uh and so that the na the navigator could take you to the target at night uh, or in bad weather and still be able to incredibly accurately deliver uh, the, you know, these 30 or 28 500 pound bombs on target, whether it was a factory or roads or, you know, a bridge or something like that. Um, that's what the ASICS was really designed to do. Mm -hmm. At some early stage of its development, uh, it got a laser, uh, a FLIR on the, on the chin, which added to its sort of brutal ugliness you know there was now a, a huge war on the bottom of this bulbous <laughs> radom <laughs> um but it was a it was an, a, a huge upgrade in the capability of the airplane because um we we meaning the world started to progress from just sort of a, a brute dropping of massive amounts of bombs to precision strike um and the laser guided bomb was developed uh, in, in the latter stages of vietnam and now the A6 was able to, you know, again, fly at night, low level, but one target, it could use this laser and forward-looking infrared to transition from the radar that the navigator was using to incredibly precise laser targeting and putting this one bomb on this one spot um, very precisely. So once it was able to do that, I think for a long time, it was the only airplane, certainly in the, in the US inventory, it was the only airplane that could do that. Massive upgrade in capability. So it went from a medium attack bomber to, you know, a precision, uh, a precision striker. Um, 
And then by the time I got to it, it was in the very latter stages of its life. Uh, and it had a, yet another upgrade, and it was now – there was some digital components thrown into it, so we were able to fire off the HARM missile, uh, which is the high-speed anti-radiation missile, anti-radar basically. Um, and then uh, there was a, you know a- anything anything that you could fire air to ground uh, pre-GPS ordinance, the ASICs could, could fire harpoon missiles, which are anti-ship missiles, um, Maverick, whether it was the laser or the TV-guided Mavericks, uh, and that was a rocket. Um, a, a big warhead rocket. Um, obviously, the laser and the dumb bombs, as we call them, the non-guided bombs. So it was an incredibly capable airplane, um, still obviously able to fly day and night, low altitude, through any weather, and deliver that. Uh, I got to the plane at the end of the Cold War, uh, so I didn't have to go through the nuclear certification process, which was a like a multi-month onerous training cycle that uh, new crews would have to go through before they became what was called nuke certified to fly uh, to to plan for and fly and execute a mission with the the nuclear bombs but i didn't have to do that i, I literally missed it by maybe a month yeah lucky then. <laughs> yeah it was very lucky it was it was good for me with your ground training was there a a, a simulator at the time i'm guessing it was nothing like you, these modern day simulators we have um you know in the air force today or the navy we, let's see, we had a 360 degree dome simulator, which w- which had very uh, sophisticated uh, graphics, but it didn't move. Um, and so <laughs> it was, it, uh, I didn't like it at all. I mean, it was, it was a remarkable piece of technology. It was great training, um, you know, to be able to, to uh, prep yourself to go fly low level missions. Um, and it was great training for, you know, practicing on an overseas strike so you could fly a mission overseas without actually being overseas which is remarkable um but the fact that the cockpit or the 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 actual simulator itself didn't move but just the graphics moved would really mess with my head i would get a (laughs) migraine coming out of that thing so um i didn't like it that much so to become a night level certified intruder pilot you had to do three flights um all within one week. The first flight was, and they were all in the same low-level route. Uh, the first flight was in the simulator, and, and it, it had to be with the same crew as well. I'm sorry. So okay. you and your navigator together would have to fly th- the the same low-level three times. Once in the simulator, once uh, during the day, and then usually that very night you would fly the same low-level at night. Um, and what it did really was, it, it, and I'll get to this a little bit later, but the A6 was very, very much designed around. Uh, the radar and the, and the capabilities that the navigator was able to bring to the airplane, mm-hmm. um, the bombardier navigator, the BN. Um, and what it did was it really gave the BN a great sense of comfort uh, for being able to navigate through all of his radar waypoints, um, you know, through the simulator, which, again, not, wasn't just a visual simulator. You know, it had all the data for the radar uh, that the navigator was going to use. So it was super sophisticated, I, I think, in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I got to, and we call it uh, the RAG. It stands for Replacement Air Group here in, in the States. And uh, I got to the A6 RAG in September of 93, and I was combat ready, as you say, or I finished the RAG in um, July of 94, so not quite a year. That's an interesting time uh, because that exactly straddles. I got there right as uh, Saddam invaded Kuwait, wow. <laughs> and uh, you know, in the middle of my training, uh, the the uh, the first Gulf War began. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I straddled basically my entire training in that plane. Straddled the uh, the course of that conflict, um, which was very interesting. Uh, I have to say, uh, you know, we. But when I got into the Navy, there was no sense of a great war. There were, you know, Vietnam had been over for a long time. Um, and uh, there, there was nothing on the horizon until all of a sudden in August of 90, you know, that <laughs> the world changed dramatically uh, overnight. And, um, you know, we at the, at the time, the Iraqi Air Force was, I think, the fifth largest in the world. Yeah. And Baghdad was the... Uh, second or third most heavily defended uh, city in the world in terms of surface to air missiles and AAA and, and, you know, the integrated air defense system. Um, And so the intruder figured heavily into the war plan and the war plan itself uh, was expected to take 
a minimum of a year, maybe two years. You know, people have, were still thinking back to the days of Vietnam where things took many, many years and months to, uh, to execute. And um, probably one of the most interesting times in my Navy career and in specifically in that training was uh, right before we got a, a, a few days off to go visit our family for Christmas. And they called all of us in there. And I don't know if you remember, but the, the war, you know, the, the president, President Bush at the time had given Saddam a, a deadline of January 16th, um, which was rapidly approaching. It was about a month, less than a month away. Mm-hmm. And so we, before Christmas, we all, all the students were brought into an auditorium and one of our instructors mm-hmm. got up and said, hey, listen, this is real. This is going to happen, you know, three weeks from now undoubtedly we're going to war and it's a big war it's gonna it's not like we're not bombing Saddam or we're not we're not bombing the Libyans or you know this isn't a one-day strike this is gonna be a, a multi-year effort and when you guys come back the term replacement air group the replacement part means that you are replacing somebody who's gonna be dead Wow. so write your wills say goodbye to your parents you're going to war when you come back. Mm. Um, and that was incredibly sobering. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop and there was, you know, a couple of hundred of us in that auditorium. Um, and I'll never forget that. I mean, I went home and talked to my parents and said, you know, this is, this is like, I'm likely going to war here in, in the next three to four months. Uh, and the plane I'm flying is not well suited to this environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> And must have been very difficult to have that conversation. It was one of the more difficult ones I think I've ever had. Um, and I'm sure it was uh, difficult for my parents to, you know, to listen to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And my wife, uh, I'd already had a conversation like that with my wife. But, you know, it's, it was it was definitely sobering because up until that time, you know, being in, in college, I was, like I said, in the RTC. And then in my first few years, I was in training and we were just having fun. It was fun, you know, hot rod jets and, you know, young kids and have, having a great time and living this exciting and dramatic life. And then all of a sudden this guy says, hey, guess what? You are going to war in six months because somebody else is going to be dead and you're going to take their spot. So scary it was, uh, yeah. It was very much of a scary thought. Now, obviously, things didn't work out that way. Um, the war was over in 43 days, and uh, I ended up joining a squadron. Uh, I joined them the day they came home, and it was uh, one of the more accomplished squadrons in A6 uh, history at the time. You know, in this war, they they did incredible things, uh, and and they had lost an airplane, so they were a very tight knit squadron, and you know. I showed up as the new guy, bright and, uh, bright and excited, and they, <laughs> they ignored me for six months, I think. <laughs> um, we'll get maybe back to that a bit later on, but uh, let's get back to the A6. Um, so, yeah. yeah, what was it like, um, I suppose, your thoughts about working with a guy? I mean, you've obviously mentioned it before, but sitting side by side, that's just very strange uh, for, you know, a fighter aircraft. Yeah, it is strange. Yeah. Um, It took some getting used to, but uh, there's some aspects of flying right next to somebody which are fantastic um, tactically and sort of, uh, you know, socially, socialization in the cockpit. You know, you can if if there's any question, you can actually turn to the right and look at the guy and say, you know, like shrug, like what? (laughs) What's he saying? What what are we supposed to do? Where are we going? You know, and uh, so the, the the crew integration, the crew coordination in the A6 was better than any other plane I had or, or will fly. It was really fantastic. And, um, not having, I I had never had to deal with, uh, navigators with non, you know, non pilots before I'd gone through a year and a half of training and it was all pilots and pilots instructors. And so we, you know, developed this sense that we were the people that were important in aviation. And then you get to this community that's really built around, the radar and the, the forward looking infrared and, and you learn uh, pretty quickly that in the A6 community, you know, your job was to get the BN where you needed to go. You know, you're, <laughs> you were a glorified chauffeur, um, which was cool. You know, it was really neat. It was, I, I, uh, I still got to fly, you know, flying low levels was um, intense and fun and really, uh, really pleasurable and enjoyable. Um, 
and that was my job, right? I was I was in charge of flying through that ravine at you know 150 feet and you know 500 knots. That was that was my job. It wasn't his job. It was cool, um, but you know he was his job was to uh, to get us to the target at night while we were flying through these canyons and. Unlike, say, the F-111, which was the Air Force's equivalent to the A-6, mm -hmm. we hand flew everything. There was wow. no terrain flying radar. I didn't let I didn't let go of the controls and and have the you know have George take over. We hand flew everything, uh, and the amount of trust you needed to place in the uh, in the BN who was sitting right next to you, you know. You, at night, they would fly with this shroud over the radar uh, so that, you know, the, the ambient light of the radar didn't ruin the pilot's night vision. Mm -hmm. And and it kind of looked like he was sticking his head into a cat's butt, which was, <laughs> of course, what, <laughs> what us pilots would tease them. But, you know, he'd st stick his head into this thing, and but his hands were on the outside, and he'd manipulate all the radar controls. And, and it was – it was – there was no computer associated with his controls. They were literally – moving you know the the tilt up and down and 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 the and the ranges so that there was it was a very manual um and very um demanding skill that they executed and then on the on the pilot side we would have this uh, adi the screen right in front of us with very rudimentary um graphics that showed us the valleys uh and that was computer generated and i'd have the little airplane symbol and i'd my job was to take this little airplane symbol and sort of navigate it down these valleys and, you know, keep us from crashing. But, but there was, it was all based on the trust, um, that the BN knew where he was going, knew what he was doing and, um, and would get us to the target on time. You know, that was another thing we had to get there on time on target, literally sometimes to the second. Um, and so the, uh, the crew coordination and the trust that that we developed in each other was unlike uh, anything I've ever been involved with before or since. So it was, it was very gratifying. Um, and you know, like we could come off target and literally like high five, you know, high five. <laughs> we, during the day you'd see it, you'd pull off the target and you'd rolled up to the left. Uh, and you know, we'd both be looking down at the target and you count down on the little stopwatch or whatever and boom, you know, something would blow up and you look at each other, whip, hop, high five and <laughs> off you go. So it was That's pretty awesome. cool. And what was it like to handle? What were the strengths and weaknesses? Um, well, uh, I'll start off with the weaknesses. Um, so, again, it was a plane designed, uh, say, in the late 50s. Um, so it was slow, uh, and it was there was zero stealth to it. It could not have been less stealthy. Uh, it practically had a beacon on it. Um, it, uh, it didn't have really good uh, radar warning gear until right at the very end, which unfortunately didn't help it um, in any of its major conflicts. So it, it was a very vulnerable airplane, which is why we, you know, we had that big meeting um, in the middle of training because they expected to lose a lot of them, mm -hmm. um, especially in the desert where there's not a lot of places to hide. So, I mean, I, I guess those were, were really its, its biggest weaknesses, that the speed um, – the size and, it, and its survivability uh, and lack of stealth. Mm -hmm. um, the strengths were, you know, were many. Uh, it, I touched on it earlier. It could carry a lot of ordnance and it could carry uh, a wide variety of ordnance, which makes it uh, very, um, you know, very useful in terms of uh, mission planning. Uh, it flew great. Uh, you know, when you're flying and literally I could fly that thing at 50 feet at, at you know, 500 knots and just feel absolutely comfortable just wow. really very very comfortable um and in fact when i my first flight um my first low level flight so not familiarization flight but low level flight and we went right into low levels you know you learn to fly the airplane you got a couple familiarization flights where you just go up and you know figure out where all the buttons were and do a few landings and then boom, you're right into low levels. And my very first low level flight, I was flying with this huge Marine. Um, he's a little bit taller than me. Great guy. And, um, we were supposed to go no lower than 500 feet on the first low level. And I was like, man, this is great. I'm, I'm having a good time out here. And, uh, there's a, there's an adjustment on the radar altimeter and you could set a warning 
wherever you want it. And I think my warning, you know, we were briefed to set the warning at like 450 feet or something like that. And, you know, if you dipped, if the plane would dip below 450 feet, it would, it would deedle at you, which wasn't, you know, unusual. We were always kind of, uh, you know, nipping at the bottom edge of wherever that safety was set. And I, rem- I remember the BN looked out to the right and I sort of slinked over and I turned the, the needle down to 200 feet, <laughs> the, the warning needle. And, you know, few minutes later, I'm down there cruising around 200 feet, and I felt totally natural, totally uh, comfortable. Um, and, you know, we flew the whole flight, and uh, I was ecstatic. It was it had been a wonderful flight. I had had a great time. We landed, and we debriefed, and then at the very end of the debrief, the guy goes, hey, and next time you move the radar altimeter needle, you better tell me, because we're a crew. <laughs> if you do that again, I'm going to break your finger. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It was great. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was good that, you know, he, he set the record straight and it was, it was actually fun for me that I had done that and kind of gotten uh, or thought I got away with it and, you know, had been put in my place, but it was, it was tough. cool that he, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got all 10 fingers. <laughs> so can you tell us uh, how you started training to land and take off on the carrier and how it differed from the A4, for instance? Yes. Um, it was actually easier to land on the carrier than the A4. And uh, for me, um, you know, and different people have different sensibilities, but for me, it was significantly easier. Uh, it was an instantaneous response on the throttle. Uh, and there was, a, there was a number of factors um, sort of wrapped around the intruder itself that made um, landing on the ship uh, pretty easy. So it had uh, a decent wing sweep, about, a, I think it was 45 degree wing sweep. Uh, it was a very draggy airplane. I touched on that earlier. so. You know, it, it, it needed thrust. It didn't glide at all. It needed engine power to, to make it go forward. Um, and then there was that instantaneous throttle response. Um, so when you're on the ball, and um, again, the, the optical landing system uh, that we use to land on the ship, um, we term the meatball or the ball for short. When you're on the ball, uh, you know, if you could, if you see the ball getting a little bit high, crowning high, and you pull the power a little bit, the the response rate from the airplane was instantaneous and it and it didn't change the angle of attack at all you didn't have to touch the stick really you just kind of pull the throttle back and the plane would come down a little bit and you'd put it back on and it, it was really super comfortable um even though it didn't have ailerons it had uh, these spoilers it would still kind of roll pretty honestly you just had to be aware that you know, if you put a little bit of right aileron in, it didn't roll around the center line of the airplane. It would drop the wing. So you, you had to add a little bit of power to compensate for that. But once, you know, after you do these things a few times, uh, they become second nature to you, like chewing and walking gum. You know, you don't have to think about either one of those. They just happen. Um, and so what we would do, and it's the same format that we do uh, in the training command before you go out to the aircraft carrier, you would literally spend a month landing on the sh- on, on the um a ship simulator runway um, uh, on land, um, and you know we just go through the pattern uh, during the day a few times, and then at night, uh, even, even though we were flying the day pattern, we would fly it at night. And what that did was it forced you to really get very precise about staying on your interior instruments until you're actually rolled out right behind the uh, ship. It, say three quarters to almost half a mile uh, before transitioning outside. So, and that was, that's a skill that uh, Navy pilots have to develop so that they don't get vertigo, so that they don't get lost in that the glide path, um, you know, too far out. Um, and you just go through that and you build up that muscle memory, you know, ad nauseum, it becomes just, um, you know, repetitive 10, 15, 20 landings. And then you go back and, and, and you do it again the next night. Once you're done with that and you sort of develop a level of proficiency and and each landing you do is graded. Every single landing you do is graded by these people called the landing signals officers, LSOs. Um, And they're a huge part of the naval aviation, naval aviation community. They're, you know, these people that are tasked with um, training and grading uh, Navy carrier Landing pilots, because what we do is so precise and important that you know this, there's this huge value um, placed on that one aspect of how we fly. And then there's this cadre of of men and women that, um, as an 
additional task to their normal duties, they become landing signals officers. Um, so while you're uh, a student, each and every one of your landings uh, is graded. And then after every flight, they drive back to the base and they debrief you and they say, you know, you were a little high here, you're a little low there. And, and what they try to do is they try to uh, decipher trends out of the way you're flying um, and, you know, correct those obviously before you go to the ship and then really ingrain that into your muscle memory. And once you're done with that, then off you go. You go to the ship and, and you do uh, 10 day landings and six night landings uh, to get qualified. And you have to achieve a certain grade point average and sort of a, a general safety uh, parameter. So let's talk about your first squadron with the A6. And also, did you ever get to practice dropping live um, weapons or bombs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did that quite a bit. Um, I mean, that's... That's what the A6 did. We flew low levels and we dropped bombs. And we did that a lot. Um, and we mostly dropped inert bombs. Uh, you know, it's it's almost comical to look at them. They're, they're called Mark 76s. They're these little 26-pound blue bombs that, you know, look silly strapped onto a big airplane. But everybody, you know, everybody in NATO basically, I think, drops Mark 76s. Um, and then uh, sometimes you drop... Uh, bombs that look live but they're actually inert and they have a different paint scheme on them um, but they have they they in terms of the weight and the drag and the way that the plane handles um they simulate live weapons and but when they hit um you know they don't explode obviously they're just made of cement but yes so uh, uh frequently um we dropped live bombs um and it was always a big deal you know because they're live bombs um uh we did it in training in uh, VA-128, which was my uh, A6 training squadron. Uh, and then once we got to the fleet, we did it uh, much more frequently um, when we would go do workups. So b before a squadron goes on deployment uh, with the carrier air wing, um, it's involved in what's called workups, uh, which are a series of deployments to uh, either Navy Fallon or, or some other places uh, where the air wing uh, gets to work together um, as a team uh, and start uh, building up their proficiency at um, uh, coordinated strikes and stuff like that. And, um, you know, you, you act, you know, the, the, the phrase we use is, you know, fight the way you train, train the way you fight. So to the highest degree possible, we would, you know, once we start getting to these higher level missions is we would fly them exactly the way we would if we were going into combat you know we would that we would have air support from the fighters we would have live weapons we would have adversary airplanes uh, trying to tap us before and after we we're on an off target um so it felt very 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 much like you were going into combat uh with you know sort of the realization in the back of your mind that nobody was really going to shoot at you but but still the, the seriousness that was put on it was basically the same level mm -hmm. I was lucky. I got to shoot harpoon missiles. Uh, I got to shoot Maverick. I got to shoot rockets, which is a really cool weapon to fire. So yeah, I, I did a lot of a uh, lot of live ordnance. That sounds cool. Yeah. So did uh, you ever get to work with any other nations in the A6? And how, if so, how did they view the A6 at this point? I so I did, but I never. Um, it was you know, it was on deployment. So I never came face to face with them, but we had we had the most amazing mission um, in Iraq. And again, my first deployment, I think I was 24 years old. So I'm still very, very young in the in the real world. But in the military, all you know, at 24, when you're in a fleet uh, squadron, you're starting to get fairly seasoned. Um, you're doing a lot of work. So, you know, I felt pretty competent. Um, but we had this one um, training flight off the carrier, off the coast of Kuwait, where um, there was going to be myself and one other A6, and I was leading the A6s, uh, were going to be escorted by two Kuwaiti Hornets. And then the opposition, well, I'm sorry, and then we're all leaving from the same spot off the coast of Kuwait. Um, and then there was going to be two Kuwaiti A4s and the Kuwaitis had some really, really cool A4s. Uh, we're going to be going in the opposite direction. So Kuwait, for those of you who don't know, is very, very small nation. Um, it's, it's essentially a city state, kind of like, you know, the Vatican or Monaco or something like that. So it's, it's, it's a country, but it's also just really a city. Uh, so we were going to be flying, 
um, counterclockwise, you know, up the coast north and then cutting inland and attacking this uh, airfield on the northwest side of Kuwait on the border with Iraq. And then these Kuwaiti A4s were going to be doing the same thing but going south first and then cutting across the Kuwaiti-Saudi Arabia border and then cutting north to get to the very same airfield but from the opposite direction. And then we were going to be escorted by Hornets, uh, Kuwaiti Hornets. And then the opposition was going to be British Tornados. Yeah. Um, but the air to air variant, I can't remember exactly what that was called. The F3, yeah. G- GR1, right? Or GR3? GR1 is the bomber, F3 is the interceptor. Of F3. Okay, cool. So, yeah, that was going to be the opposition. And we were flying, we were, we were doing the A6 mission, man. We were flying, you know, at, as low as we could stand it. Uh, and it was a beautiful, sunny day in Kuwait, which it is, 390 days a year. Um, and I never saw any of these people. All the briefing was done via messaging. And, you know, it, <laughs> so the coordination was very suspect. But sure enough, we get to the rendezvous point at the right time. And, you know, we pull up our frequencies. And there they are, these two uh, out, out of nowhere, magically, these two Kuwaiti hornets appear on either either side of my formation, one on each side. And I see the Kuwaiti A4s. And, you know, everything seems to be going perfectly. Um, and so off we go. We go down to about 200 feet uh, up the coastline, and the the uh, Kuwaiti Hornets are uh, maybe at a thousand feet, uh, which makes you know. Now that I have flown fighters, it makes their, their that tactic makes absolutely no sense. But anyway, they were <laughs> they were relatively close to us um, as a fighter escort, and you know we're flying our mission, and, and now we we have a common frequency, and we start hearing other people starting. Uh, beginning to get engaged and you know that the adrenaline levels up and the excitement levels up and we're looking around and all of a sudden in the distance I see a tornado like uh, coming out of the sky at seven eight thousand feet and our two hornets whoosh, off they go they go off and engage and uh, we lose them so now we're uh, naked and unafraid we had to turn to a to defend ourselves a little bit so uh, we're a little bit off on timeline and frankly we're not really paying attention to it at all anyway we're just going as fast as we can and um, before we get to the target um, we get jumped by another section of uh, tornadoes, and uh, but they they just turned with us briefly for a couple, you know, maybe 180 degrees of turn, and then we we disengage from them, and you know there's chatter on the radio from all different aspects. You know, you can hear uh, British accents, you can hear American accents, you can hear Kuwaiti accents. Everybody's obviously speaking English, but with these wide variety of accents and and, and a huge range of whether or not you can actually understand what people are saying, (laughs) because, uh, you know, even though we're speaking English, the Brits don't sound necessarily or say the same thing we say when we, you Mm -hmm. know, when under stress. Mm -hmm. Uh, And certainly the Kuwaitis were speaking a second language. So we we basically have no idea what's going on. And um, we're coming into the target and we, the, the plan was to do a pop, which means you're, you come in as low and as fast as you possibly can. And about six miles away from the target, you pop up to about 1800 feet, roll over, acquire the target in a dive and then, um, drop your ordinance and, and then off you go, you're off target. So I pull up and I'm in the pop. And as I look up in the pop, I see maybe four or 5,000 feet above me. There's a, uh, tornado. Uh, and he doesn't see me yet, but I know, you know, I know he's there and I'm going to have to deal with him in a second. Uh, and I roll over inverted and I pull back down. I see the target, which is very obvious. It's a hangar with a hole in it from, (laughs) from the war. Uh, It had been blown up and I'm rolling down. And as I'm in the dive at maybe 1500 feet, a thousand feet, this a (laughs) four goes in the opposite direction, right under my nose (laughs) coming, you know, it was one of the a fours that had been going, uh, uh, on the other side of the route and he was well behind his timeline. Um, so he, he never saw me. He just flew right underneath me on the same target. I'm like, Holy crap. And, uh, he's gone. I drop, you know, my simulated ordinance. I come off target and this tornado is now turning on me. So I'm in a dog fight, uh, you know, with this tornado at maybe a thousand feet pulling for, for everything I'm worth. Um, <laughs> and, uh, a Hornet, one of the, uh, Kuwaiti Hornets comes and rescues me because I was certainly no dogfighter in the A6. Uh, rescues me and jumps the uh, the tornado. My wingman and I managed to disengage from the fight and we're eg- exiting to the northeast, which is out towards the water, as literally at 
50 feet as fast as we could possibly go. My heart's pounding and it's in my throat. And we're in perfect combat spread. Everything's just incredible. And we're flying out over the water over Kuwait City. And there's these these, uh, traditional fishing boats they have. They're just beautiful fishing boats. And we're flying at mass level, just right over their head, screaming out over the water. It was just one of the more intense and amazing days I ever had. What a fantastic story. Yeah, it was so fun.